Welcome to the fourth and final night of webinars describing the engineering of our tiny lab, which is a touring tiny house, which is a little different than most tiny houses, which are built to be just moved a few times so that you can go from one place to another. We're going to have this thing on the road. Uh, we're going to talk about why soon. Uh, thank you guys very much for taking the time to be here. And if you're watching this in the recording, um, you can stay tuned for the question and answer session, which will be at the end. So everybody who's watching this right now, live, make sure as we go to type in your questions because we don't want you to forget them. And we also want to hit the ground running at the very end when we do start taking questions. So if there's anything bells and whistles wise that you have thought of for your tiny house, whether it's something you're actually planning or something that's in your imagination, either one of those is super cool and we'd love to talk with you about it. So uh, why are we doing this? Just to make sure that we're all clear about what we've covered so far. In the first week, we talked about shape and layout. That was really important because if you don't have a good foundation and structure for how this thing is going to be put together, it's not going to be fun to live in. It's not going to be fun to tow around behind your uh, giant truck, uh, which you're having to pay gas for, et cetera, et cetera. So that was uh, critical in that one. And in case you missed it, you can totally go back and watch this. It's on our YouTube channel. And we also had John Bergman, who's the engineer that we worked with to specifically find our um, point of weight distribution. The weights, yeah, the center of weight. The center of gravity for our tiny house, which is a very important thing, right? Because it's not on a solid foundation. We're moving around on wheels. Mm -hmm. So in the second week, we talked about insulation, air sealing, and weather barriers. And that's something that not a lot of people actually think of deeply. A lot of us just make a knee-jerk reaction. We think, oh, we have to have the best. And you don't. That's why energy modeling was involved in that one. And you can see exactly how much insulation actually made a difference in this house. And always there's a kind of a cost benefit relationship there. And when Corbett says best, he means you can still get the best with not the most expensive materials out there. That's, that's kind of the catch 22 there. And then in the third week, we talked about the heating, cooling and ventilation, the HVAC. And um, in that one, we found out some pretty interesting stuff. About, excuse me, I'm, I'm snacking on some dinner right now. <laughs> it is 7 o'clock at night. Uh, Hillary, we hope that you're having a good time with your bourbon or whatever it is <laughs> that you're doing right now. Um, so in all of these, we talked a lot about the engineering and the thoughtfulness and the planning that needs to go into this. We're going to be going into the actual construction of this when we are getting you guys ready for the Proof is Possible Tour. Proof is Possible Tour is coming to 16 cities in 2016. You can actually see this thing live and in person. It's going to be crowdsourced, which means that we don't know exactly where we're going. Our fans will essentially be buying cities. Uh, which is not a normal way to run a tour. No, but I'm sure you guys have seen crowdfunding before. I mean, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, they're all out there. Um, one of the unique things about us is we are actually allowing those dollars to dictate where we're going to go. You know, we're, we're actually not making it 100% convenient to us because we want to go and meet with the people who want to be working with us, who want to get this message out to their clients and to the general public so that we can really rise the tide of consciousness. Yeah, so 16 cities will be bought. Um, this campaign is going to run from October 19th until Thanksgiving. Hopefully we sell out of cities long before Thanksgiving. That would be great. Um, so you can find out more about that at proofispossible.com. And if you want to learn more after today, make sure that you uh, check out my free webinar series, first Wednesday of every month. It's called the Building Forensics Mastermind Webinar Series. Uh, and it's basically a reality show where I walk you through how advanced testing and advanced design and engineering worked in real homes, which is what we do for our living when we're not doing, um, you know, building <laughs> tiny houses for ourselves. This is what we do. So that you can sign up for at buildingformanceworkshop.com. Again, that's free. And if you want to get real serious, then you come to my Fall Fast Track. And the Fall Fast Track is a six-week mastermind course. It is the found, it's like the black belt course, basically, for if you want to be a home performance badass, this is where you go. Um, and you don't have to travel for this. This is what makes it special. It is not a conference. It comes to you. So we're all working over six weeks to really put this stuff into practice. And I know you guys are going to be typing in your questions now, but if anybody does have a question about Fall Fast Track, next Friday, Corbett's going to be doing a webinar where there's not going to be any slides. It's literally just going to be him answering your questions about this. It's an Ask Me Anything webinar, and I'm really excited for it. Yeah, it'll be a good one. So this is what we're talking about today, bells and whistles. Now, the devil's in the details. We've been talking about that all along. 
And we want to make sure that the details of how our marriage survives this year <laughs> on the road. And by the way, we spent a lot of time together. So I, we think that we're particularly well suited for this. But um, there's all kinds of details that we want to make sure are there so that we can have the quality of life that we want. Because we do not want, number one, to live an ascetic life on the road. No. We don't want to feel like we're camping at any point. In fact, if you've noticed, I put the door on the tiny lab on the wrong side if we were going to park at an RV park. You know why I did that? Because I never want us to feel like it's okay to park at an RV park because that is not... I'm trying to get away from neighbors. We made this thing off-grid so that we could specifically go wherever we want to. So I don't want to go uh, you know, where it's sanctioned. That's just something that I have decided about myself. So I put the door on the other side just to make myself <laughs> remember, you can't do that because everybody's going to be mad at you. But really, this, this house for us, again, is we affectionately call it the tiny lab because it's there to be a showcase. We're actually going to be having it open almost every single day while we're on the tour um, for an hour for people to come in and talk with us and see it and check it out so that they can wrap their mind around four walls so they can go home and then think big and get the big picture. And we don't want them to think that we're crazy hippies who are doing it because we're not. And a little side note, um, I'm from Montgomery, Alabama, and I actually was a debutante. So I like the finer things. <laughs> so you can see my struggle now. So we're going to walk through this. So first of all, we're going to have to have all built-in furniture because, again, this is a touring tiny house, not a tiny house that's going to sit still for a long time. We're going to be in each city for about a week which means that we're going to be moving all the time. I don't want to be stacking chairs or tying things down or securing anything anytime at all because I want to automate this process as much as possible. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the compost mm, and the toilet. Yes. Um, this is something that is a must for us. We decided on it pretty early in the process. I'll tell you exactly why. Uh, the uh, fridge, we have been going back and forth about this, and Grace and I finally came to an agreement uh, last night, one of those marriage agreements where we shake hands on it. We have our solar electric system, photovoltaic or PV. We have Grace's amazing sink that we're going to talk about. And then cat and baby stuff because it's not just going to be our marriage that is going to be a little bit stressed out. We're going to have a baby with us. <laughs> yeah, so I guess that was the official announcement so far for the, the extra special people who are kind of listening. Yeah. We are going to have a tiny house and a tiny human. So we are building that into this as well. So let's go ahead and get into this. So first of all, the built-ins, um, we're going to have plywood. Plywood is important because it is uh, very durable. It's structurally sound. It can be thinner than wood that you would build the rest of the stuff out of. It's a lot easier to get, easier to replace just in case anything goes wrong. All plywood has formaldehyde in the glue that is putting it together, unless you buy from a manufacturer who does not use that explicitly. So we are working with Pure Bond, which is a Columbia, uh, Columbia Forest Products uh, product, and they've come on board as a product partner. We're really excited about this because that means we can have all plywood inside, really nice looking. My dad is a woodworker and he works with plywood exclusively. He has all kinds of exotic <laughs> veneers that he does all over the place. And it's just, it's going to be really beautiful. Um, so, and they've hinted that there's something coming down the pike on their product line that is going to be amazing. And this might be the prototype for them to show this to the world. So we're really excited about that. Um, the cores, they're able to make these cores because of course plywood is just a sandwich of different types of wood that are running against each grain against each other, right? Perpendicular. So it makes it stronger. The cores can be made out of whatever they want. So uh, they can, they've offered to make this out of balsa wood, which is the lightest type of wood, which is great because that means that we're saving on weight. And the last thing that's down here in the bottom is this honeycomb core panels. We got a few samples of this, and this thing... It's beautiful. It looks really sexy. So yeah. we're going to try and have some stuff in there with yeah. that. We're really excited about this. And we actually um, had a pretty engaging discussion going on in um, Missy's tiny house group on Facebook. There's about 25,000 people there. And, and uh, I brought up, I posted a picture of the honeycombs, and all of a sudden, immediately, people jumped in and talked about how they use it in boats. And um, I'm, I'm excited to even potentially consider using this as a countertop, um, potentially as the floor to the dining loft space. It's, it's really beautiful and interesting. And um, I'm excited to see where we go with furniture building with honeycomb. Yeah. So 
there's our built-ins. Now, as far as once you get down to the plumbing level, which we kind of touched on last week, um, you can see here that, first of all, we're going to have, of course, because we're off-grid, remember, we're going to have a water reservoir. This is going to be probably a 50-gallon tank. You can apparently fill up water all over the place in public. We did not know this until we were told yeah. by the uh, Comet Camper couple. And they, they just fill up water all over the place. There's like public bibs. There's at, an easy app even, um, a camper app. What is it called? Yeah, it's called All Stays is the name all of the All Stays, thing. and it yeah. marks every single place where you can find water. It's really great, so we're Pretty excited about that. So we won't have to worry about fresh water, um, which is good. We are, of course, because we want to contain that 50 gallons. I don't want to be running out to get water all the time while we're parked in a, a town for a week or two weeks. We're going to have all low-flow fixtures. That means uh, around a gallon, two gallons per minute tops for all of the fixtures. Um, and that goes for, obviously, we have two fixtures. One is the shower and one is the kitchen sink. <laughs> so if we run both of them at the same time, which, by the way, we're going to try and conserve by using foot pedals so that you actually press down when you want water and you're not just turning it on and then washing your hands and doing other things. So it's another kind of conservation measure. And I'm just going to say, as a future mama, I'm excited that I'm going to have hands-free <laughs> so mm -hmm. I can strap the baby to me and not have to worry about turning on and off the water. Um, I I've got a little bit of extra mobility with my foot. Exactly. Um, so if we were to run both the shower and the sink at the same time, which there's two of us in the house, that might happen, sure. Um, and again, the shower is going to be on off, on off, because we're going to be taking marine style showers just because we want to conserve. That's not an ascetic thing to us. It allows us to live the way that we want to live on the road. Um, that would only require two and a half gallons per minute. Now, last week, we talked a little bit about water heating. And one of the things about the water heater was that we're going to go tankless because we can't go electric because we need to be off-grid. And the only way to use gas is to have a, an on-demand system, right? Because we don't want to have a 40-gallon water heater in this thing. It would be ridiculous. So two and a half gallons per minute, if you know anything about on-demand water heaters, they have a minimum flow rate to be able to fire. So they, they're sensing the water flow. And if it starts moving at a certain clip, they'll fire up. Two and a half gallons per minute is actually below most of the water heater's uh, minimum flow rates but to, to fire. I don't want to be taking cold showers. Yeah, exactly. So we're really trying to figure that one out still. That's kind of a question that we still have, and we're trying to reach out. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of what we're doing with it being tiny is we're trying to wade through products that are alternately very high quality and happen to be small, or very, very cheap, right? <laughs> and so, like, it's almost impossible to try and distinguish between those two at first glance. You really have to do a lot of research to figure out whether something is very, very small and cheap or very, very small and high quality. Yeah, it's been amazing in this process. Um, definitely the design and figuring out what we wanted to do uh, engineering-wise was interesting and time-consuming, but really, these bells and whistles, hunting after them, finding the specifications, looking at different vendors, has been a, a real time suck. Um, but we feel good about it, and we feel worth it. But yes, but again, I'm sure all of you are doing it, too. <laughs> if you guys have ideas um, or questions, please type them in. Yeah. So the composting toilet, obviously, right? We're going we're gonna to get into that right now. So toilet, no water. Um, it has two holes, right? If you've, I'm imagining you guys have looked into this a little bit. You're watching our tiny house webinar. I'm sure that you know about this stuff. So, uh, here's the thing. We looked up, um, first of all, about the sewer hookup, because of course we want to be off grid. Remember, we can't have a sewer hookup, which means we can't then do anything with a normal toilet without a black water tank, which I don't want a tank that's full of disgusting, toxic waste water inside of my house. That's just not allowed for either of us. So it also makes things more complicated. This is how RVs generally deal with it. They have a black water tank and you have to get it treated and you got to go and to the RV park and empty it. And it's just like a big pain. It's like an extra step to everything. Right. So we have looked at Nature's Head, we looked at the Separate, and we looked at some others. And we've also even considered the homemade thing. We decided against the homemade for reasons that we've already mentioned. Grace was a debutante. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to be married and happy at the end of this. So um, going to the bathroom in a bucket is not part of our 
thing. Um, if it's a very expensive bucket that has a lot of levers and pulleys and things like that, <laughs> this is essentially what that is. <laughs> but it's going to allow us to, to do this. Now, if you come and visit the tiny house, you won't have to go into the bathroom to see that because that thing actually comes out. If you can detach it and put it outside um, so that we'll, we'll be able to explore it. I'll have a... Um, yeah, that's so glamorous. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say there's a great couple that's on the road um, called The Winds. And they have a really great, they, they have a RV that they're traveling around in. Um, but they got rid of their black water tank. They got rid of it and, and put Anna Nature's head. And they had a great video just kind of explaining their experience with it. And it was um, convincing. Yeah. Now, check this out. I just want to reiterate, this right here is something that is actually better than a normal toilet. The toilet that you have in your house is not as good as this one right here, odor-wise. Here is why. That right there, what I was pointing out, is a port for your ventilation. So the way that we're gonna be able to do this is hook it up to our inline ventilation system that we're gonna have that's hooked up to the bath exhaust, the kitchen exhaust, and to the cat litter exhaust, which I'm gonna show you in a little bit. Um, and so the air is constantly flowing down and into the toilet. So no matter what odors happen around the toilet or when you're going to the bathroom, it's all going down unlike the toilets that we all have in our houses, which we have this fan that's up in the ceiling and like all, you know, all the air around you has to go up and kind of wander its way up to the ceiling. So this is actually more sanitary if you think about it in an odor kind of a sense than a normal toilet, which I'm really excited about. So the refrigerator. Now mm. this, is, this is a big thing that kind of blew up this week actually. So here's what we were looking at. When you're gonna go off grid, the refrigerator has a compressor in it, and the compressor pulls electricity, and the electricity is kind of hard to anticipate because it depends on how often you open and close that refrigerator. And I don't, I didn't really want to mess around with trying to make a rule for our family that you can only open the refrigerator three times a day. Um, that sounds ridiculous. I don't want to be that guy. So we looked at this, uh, what's called a two-way or a three-way refrigerator. These are the ones that you find in RVs. This is powered by either AC electricity, which is alternating current, which is what you have in your house, DC, which is what will come off of our solar system or off of a battery, or propane. And it's kind of weird to think about a refrigerator running off of propane because propane is, would be hot when you burn it. But anyway, uh, it can work, and apparently it's very efficient. Yeah, and we thought, hey, we're not going to be loading up a ton of solar, so let's run the refrigerator off of um, propane. That makes sense. Exactly. So we were going to just position it where it would just run off of propane as its default. Uh, however, this happens when you have a propane refrigerator. Now, this is not a surprise to me. I should have seen this coming. Uh, venting requirements and and taking care of combustion gases is not taken very seriously in something that you'd see uh, at a green goods store where you're looking at ventless fireplaces, even alcohol fireplaces. Anytime you're burning anything, there is byproducts that are in the, the gas that comes off of that. One of them is moisture. One of them is obviously carbon dioxide, which is uh, not good for you, but it's fine. It's not going to poison you to death generally, and carbon monoxide. So what they make you do is they say, just poke a hole low and high behind the refrigerator, uh, and it'll it'll vent itself. It's fine. And you build this little enclosure. And all of that sounds ridiculous to me. Um, as you know from previous webinars, we have engineered the heck out of this thing with the air tightness and the insulation. And I am not cutting two big old holes in this house just for this little tiny refrigerator. So what we've decided instead is uh, this, which is a chest style refrigerator. Now this is, Grace was gonna let me just go electric. Um, she was fine with that. I had to really push for this thing because this is a little bit weird, obviously. Um, the great thing about this though is, I don't have to get stressed out about how often people open and close the refrigerator door because when you open the refrigerator door, none of the air leaks out onto the floor. So this is way, way more efficient than a vertical upright refrigerator, um, which is going to make my blood pressure go down and everything is going to be happy for me. And even though Corbett says happy wife, happy life, it's definitely good to make your husband happy too. So yeah. it was an easy compromise, even though 
It's not quite as pretty and takes up counter space. <laughs> no, but we can cover it with some. So it'll have like a cutting board on top yeah. of it. Yeah. So solar electric, uh, we figured that we need 1,000 watt hours per day. Um, and load, by the way, remember, is the worst case load. It's if you take everything and you add it up and you run everything at the exact same time, uh, that would be an issue. So we've got our two laptops, which are both going to pull. Let's imagine that we're running them you know, charging them for four hours a day each. They each are pulling 85 watts. The exhaust fan um, and Panasonic is going to be our product partner for the ventilation side of this. And Panasonic's fans are really cool in that they run seven watts, or excuse me, seven CFM per watt. That means if I have a seven watt fan running, it would be pushing 49 CFM, which is way more than I'd need. So seven watts tops uh, is what we're looking at. More like it'd be probably four watts for that exhaust system. The LED lighting, uh, we're imagining that if we run all 20 of our lights and they're they're all like real big mothers that are five watts a piece, then we have 100 watts there. So we're gonna need two or three panels, depending on how size, you know, how big they are, uh, and some batteries. We thought about, for a hot second, since we're going to be driving this so much, we were like, well, what if we put a wind turbine yeah, on the, the house? And so when we drive it, we're able to actually charge the batteries up while we're on the road. Um, but apparently, wind turbines don't work that way. If you get them running fast enough, they shut down. They they uh, short out the, uh, the connection there. So they stop supplying electricity if it gets too high. We also thought, hey, we're bringing our bicycles because we're big bikers. Maybe we could, um, you know. Jerry rig a little generator. Yeah, and, and remember that like a lot of this stuff, just like with the three weeks of rain that we kind of <laughs> hypothesized in the last <laughs> webinar, this one is what if the sun doesn't come out for three weeks straight? Like, I don't know. That's possible, I guess. What if a volcano erupts and nobody is paying attention to a tiny house tour? <laughs> we don't know. But anyway, if we don't have any sun, how are we going to get this? So we've got two options. So that Grace mentioned the bike generator. We also have the truck. We could actually run the truck and use the truck as a generator, and that'll be kind of an interesting thing. So we're going to be wired for both AC and DC. Uh, DC is important because the LEDs run off of DC, apparently, and we don't want to have to switch into AC and then switch back into DC, so we're just going to have both. So here's what it looks like, by the way. Um, this is from a, a great website called whatyouneed.com. Um, they've got kits, and so they had this fantastic little diagram, and it breaks down kind of what's going on. So we've got two... Solar panels, they're going to be hooked onto the charge controller, which is going to be kind of managing things. That sends the power into the batteries, and the batteries supply things to the house through the inverter, which is converting it back into AC, alternating current. Um, so that was kind of cool. Those are the four components that you need. So happy wife, happy life is what Grace said, mm -hmm. and I always say that because it is incredibly important. So this sink, uh, we're not sure exactly how much it costs. We found the prices from like $800 to $1,600, but... Uh, some people might think, oh, that's so expensive. Why are you doing that? Well, we don't have one sink yeah. in the entire house. So if you're going to have one, right? Yeah, might as well get the one you really want. And I have dreamed of an apron sink, and I love the brass. And I, I just, you know, want a big, nice tub because this is not only our sink. It's where I'm going to bathe the baby. It's where I'm going to do laundry. <laughs> you know. I'm going to do laundry too, by the way. <laughs> Fellas, it's important that you share in the income stuff, so. Uh, but it's nice to have this added bit of comfort because I don't, you know, again, we're we're not doing this to be 100% uh, uh, ascetic, as Corbett mentioned. Um, we want a little bit of luxury. We want to be comfortable. This isn't this isn't just um, about sacrifice or anything like that. It's our life, and we're going to be in this for a good year or two, maybe longer. Um We'll see how it goes. In fact, this is very much about, it's not just, it's not that we want a little bit of luxury. We want a lot of luxury. And part of the luxurious thing about this trip is we get to do whatever we want, whenever we want. Like, that's pretty cool. Secondly, uh, all the things that we have, if we have less things, we can spend more money on them. I think that's one of the big, obviously, yeah. perks of the tiny living movement, which we uh, really enjoy, we don't really see ourselves as ambassadors of the tiny living movement, but it definitely does have its perks, where if you have one sink, you could spend as much money as you would have on your three sinks in your bigger house on just that one and make it really nice. We met this woman, I got a Grace a, a tarot card reading a couple of years ago. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> and this woman uh, didn't have any furniture in her place, really. She just had, she moved in like 
two months ago, and she still had no furniture. She said, I'm really sorry, but it takes me some, a while to get stuff because I, I have a rule that if I don't love something, it's not allowed in my house. And we loved that. That may have been one of our biggest takeaways from the tarot reading card, um, that we just, we really, really connected. Yeah. yeah. Let's bring things we love into our life. And so this is what this is about. And we love our cats. And we do love our cats. Um, and some people love our cats, and our cats love some people, but sometimes they're <laughs> a little. So anyway, uh, the cats have this loft. What would be in a lot of other tiny houses, like a storage loft, this is going to be where the cats can hang out and be up high and look down on everybody, which is what they enjoy doing because they're very superior. Um, <laughs> so what's cool about this is that you can see that there's that little doorway, a little kind of hole in the back. And what that leads to is the litter box over there, which is above the toilet in the bathroom. So what we can do is just go in, do our business, stand up in the morning and turn around and be able to open up this latched door. Um, well, obviously when they're not in there and be able to empty the litter from right there. And again, that litter box is going to have a vent uh, connection in it. So it's going to be exhausted, which means the air is going to be going down into that hole in the floor of the loft, down that hallway, and constantly exhausting those uh, odors, if there are any, which is obviously the goal. So the last thing uh, is travel safety. We are taking a couple steps here. We're going to get a CB radio. I have a trucker friend uh, who... Um, He's going to teach us great advice. Yeah, yeah. he's going to teach us how to use this thing. And we're going to get a handle and all that stuff. We are going to get a trucker atlas. This is important because it has road clearances on it. Really important before you start driving around something as big as a tiny house behind your, your truck. We are going to have a flexible schedule, which means that if it is really windy or if it's storming, we don't drive that day yeah. because we're building it so that we've got these 16 cities over 10 months. And that gives us, if we're only spending a week in each city, a few days that we can travel so we can take like, you know, take a day off, not travel that day, and then travel when it's really nice uh, weather-wise so that it's not buffeting the uh, the giant box that we've got behind the truck. We're also, obviously, for road debris and rocks and stuff like that, we're going to have window shutters. Obviously, the windows are going to be tempered glass. That's important. But also, um, we're going to have shutters that we close over them. The cats are going to travel in the truck with us, and insurance. Now, the insurance on the truck is the thing that is going to protect the tiny house because on a touring tiny house, you can't get insurance, apparently. Yeah, insurance varies from state to state, and right now they're even still just trying to figure out how to insure tiny houses. Um, uh, Lloyd's, Lords. Lloyd's of London Lloyd's is doing London. it, but they only do it in eight states right now, and right. so we're going to be in every state. It doesn't matter. So uh, we're not going to have house insurance we're going to have insurance on what is being towed behind the truck we don't know what that means and i bet that the insurance company doesn't know what that means either so we're going to have a very explicit conversation with them about that so thank you very much for your time tonight uh we are i think are we right on time oh holy my moly gosh. it's the that first time we didn't run over amazing. <laughs> So we hope that you guys tune in and watch us actually build this thing because we're going to be posting to our YouTube channel like crazy. So yeah. go ahead and subscribe now. The YouTube channel is right there. Uh, it's called the Home Performance Channel. And then also make sure that you subscribe to our email bulletins if you're not already subscribed there. I know many of you are already. You can do that at buildingperformanceworkshop.com because we'll remind you when we're going to be coming to your town or when we're going to be uh, doing all kinds of different stuff. But there's going to be tons of events on this. All right. Bells so, and whistled questions. Questions. Uh, Albert Aww. says, hi, Corbett. It's hot. That's awesome. I don't know what that means. <laughs>